Um, so just a couple things to wrap up talking about rapid toilet training. One is planning for initiation. So a, a lot of the time, it's, and I, I guess I should say initiation for the purposes of what we're talking about today means the trainee starts approaching the bathroom on their own, showing that they're going to go pee or poop on their own. They, you know, kind of choose to leave the, the break and go in and, and pee or poop on their own in the bathroom. For some trainees, that might be accompanied with verbally telling someone, hey, I'm going to go pee. It might be accompanied by using their AAC device or a picture symbol or some other communicative way, a sign um, that they're going to go to the bathroom. But it doesn't necessarily occur that way, especially in a home. We don't usually tell our family members when we're going to go pee, right? We just kind of go in there. So a lot of trainees, we find the same thing happens. They start just going into the bathroom on their own, which is really cool and a great outcome. Um, so we'll talk a bit tomorrow about ways in which that requesting and initiation training can happen separately if it doesn't happen organically in your rapid toilet training process. So more is coming on initiation later. It's often something people have a lot of questions about. So what you wanna do um, to maximize the chances you're gonna get initiation as an outcome of your rapid toilet training procedure that you're doing with your trainee. One is you could build in some teaching on requesting the toilet using the trainee's current method of requesting. So by the time you've worked through all those phases and you're at phase six, the last part of the, the intensive rapid toilet training schedule where they're having a 30 minute break and you're bringing them to the toilet for a maximum of five minutes, again, usually what we're seeing at this phase is they're peeing really quickly once you, once you bring them into the bathroom. Many trainees will just start going in the bathroom on their own, but if they're not, what you can do is go, okay, now I have a bunch of data from th these last couple days, and I'm seeing this person with their increased fluids, they're peeing about every half hour. So when it's time to go back to the bathroom on that half hour, instead of just going, come on, let's go to the bathroom, I'm gonna give them an opportunity to tell me they need to go. So however you're currently teaching, requesting to that, that trainee in their life in general, you would then use that strategy to have them tell you they need to go to the bathroom. So um, if they have, you know, if they're using a picture exchange system and they have picture symbols, that they could have one that shows the bathroom. When you're like, I think you got a full bladder based on the information that I have, you'd present that picture option. They could then give it to you you could bring them into the bathroom and it's more at their request. So it's prompted, but, and I, I can't describe easily a method that would work for anybody who, who's watching this and any trainee they might have in mind because communication is so individual, right? So I'm just hoping this plants a seed for you of how you might build in um, that communication training to initiation. And we will talk about this more tomorrow. Another thing that I've found really helps, this is not a, you know, research-based uh, method. This is just something that we've found in practice absolutely seems to have an impact. And one day, I'm sure, I'll be sure to study it, make it official. But in my experience, having the reinforcers kind of live in the bathroom if you can really helps. So again, that's why I say, right, like the ice cream, it has to be in the bathroom so you can give it immediately, but it also having it in the bathroom makes the trainee more likely to really associate it with the whole toilet training thing. And, and they'll make, it'll make them wanna wander into the bathroom more than if it was in the freezer. And then they're just wandering into the kitchen looking for ice cream. Well, if they're wandering into the bathroom looking for ice cream, they're more likely gonna get, but first I gotta pee. They're getting the sort of chain of events that leads to the ice cream a little bit better usually. So I've just found, Keep them in the bathroom, even when it seems like you're kind of fading out of the toilet training process and it's not a big deal anymore, just keep them in the bathroom. I, I really think it's a tip that can help, um, help the trainee start to really understand, that's why I get that thing, I pee, I, so I need to go in the bathroom if I wanna get my ice cream. It, it makes all the pieces fall into place a little bit better. So just a, a tip I advise. Another thing is, when it's time to go to the bathroom, based on your rapid toilet training schedule that you're following, especially as you kind of get on through the phases, things are rolling, the, to the greatest extent possible, it's great if you can use a really sort of subtle form of assistance to get them into the bathroom. So 
it, yeah, it becomes more possible midway through the process when they're kind of, they're getting, all right, okay, so I'm going in the bathroom, I have to sit, okay, like the, the routine sort of happening, the trainees catching on to what you're asking of them. Then you're not like jumping them excitedly to the bathroom, which is what we're often doing early in the day. Come on, let's go. This is going to be really cool. Or kind of cajoling them through it. Once they're kind of like, this is all right. I'm getting it. Um, it can be a little bit more possible to kind of um, prompt them to move independently toward the bathroom. This is, this is a subtle difference, but I really find it helps. So instead of um, telling them, okay, it's time to go, often in, as we move through the rapid coach training process, I'll go over to the trainee and kind of just put my hand on their back or shoulder and start moving them in the direction of the bathroom. Many trainees, once you start steering them that way, they start walking that way. Can you see how that could lead to more independent toileting? Like I, they're not waiting for me to tell them, you gotta go pee now. They're gonna just start moving toward the toilet on their own. And the reason is, the sort of the sequence we want them to learn is not, okay, my bladder feels full and someone's telling me I gotta go pee. So now I'm gonna go to the bathroom and pee. What we want them to learn is my bladder feels full, I'm gonna go to the bathroom and pee. Do you see the difference? Like I, I took out the part where someone tells me to go pee. So that can be a, a chain where, you know, they're really reliant on that cue. Someone saying, you better go pee now or taking them, it's time to go to the bathroom. It, and taking them to the bathroom, telling them it's time to go pee can absolutely be a key part of the early phases of learning. But as we go on, if we can remove a little bit of that assistance, um, we can avoid what we call prompt dependency, where they're, the trainee's looking for this prompt. They're not able to do it without this help. Um, so it can, yeah, it can be a really subtle way to tweak things so that you're, you're encouraging that independence a little bit more. So, Okay, the next, uh, the next thing is how do you get back to normal life after you've done this immersive, crazy focused toilet training for you know however long it took you? I mean, I, sh I should probably also say that people sometimes ask, so how many, how many days is, is rapid toilet training? And I go, well, it's not, a, it's not a number of days per se, it's how long does it take them to reach that final phase. So for some trainees, it literally takes a day. They, they drink a ton, the reinforcers are just perfect, the stars align, they get it by the end of the day, they wake up the next day and they go to the bathroom. Truly, it can happen. Some trainees, it takes them a while to get to the, the, the mastery point. Um, it can, you know, you have, can have a lot of accidents mixed in um, that delay the mastery, right? Because you need those three successes in a row like we talked about. That's totally fine. So for some trainees, it takes two weeks. For some trainees, it takes one day. Truly, it's impossible to predict before you start. If I knew how, I would tell you. You, you don't know how all these um, variables are gonna work together with a specific trainee, with specific trainers, in a specific situation, like it's, it's complicated, right? So um, knowing exactly how long it's gonna take is difficult. So we always say try to set aside two weeks if you can, just to be sure, and you might be pleasantly surprised. They might get in in a day and then you can call the dishwasher repair person to come the next day, right? Like you can kind of do some more normal life things. So um, yeah, there's no set number of days. It just doesn't work that way. It's when the mastery occurs is when the mastery occurs based on that specific trainee. Okay, so this is what post rapid toilet training life might look like. This is how we peel back the layers of the process and uh, return back to normal life. So one thing that we do at the end of the procedure is start increasing the break time. So if you recall, where we leave off is with five minutes maximum sitting on the toilet, 30 minutes break after a success. Um, many trainees, like I mentioned, are already starting to initiate at that phase, or they'll start doing it when you extend the break time between trips. So I, I just recommend adding five minutes after every success. That usually works for a lot of trainees. So you're done the procedure, You've had your three successes in the final phase, which is five minutes sitting on the toilet maximum, 30 minute break after a success. You might start going, okay, now we're gonna try a 35 minute break. Oh, we had a success. Now we're gonna try a 40 minute break. Oh, a success. Now we're gonna try a 45 minute break. And you can also start fading out that extra liquid at the same time. So you're approaching more their normal level. 
So many, many trainees, that's all it takes to fade out. You're not doing it so abruptly, but you're making it progressively just a tiny bit harder, a tiny bit harder, and there, you're gonna usually see initiation happen in that, in that moment. Um, that said, you might not see initiation happen. Again, everybody's sort of where they're at with this um, skill level that's required for initiation varies so much. So for everybody watching, you know, I can't speak about your specific situation, your specific trainees, but if, if the trainee isn't initiating when you start extending those breaks, you might need more separate initiation training that we will talk about tomorrow. So um, it'll give you more information about what to do if you do rapid toilet training, initiation hasn't occurred, we will help you. And then a, a good rule of thumb it's to continue delivering reinforcers until you have three consecutive totally dry days. This, is, this can vary a bit learner to learner too, but here's a good general blanket rule, right? Um, so once you, you're still recording data and you're seeing, wow, we've been accident free for three days, at that point, I'm very confident to say, this is no longer a new, hard, unprecedented behavior for this trainee. It's time to start withdrawing those super special extra reinforcers and getting more to what's normally available for them in their environment. So reinforcer fading should always be gradual and slow and kind of planful, right? So um, sticker charts might work, which we'll discuss tomorrow. Um, they could earn stickers toward a reinforcer rather than the reinforcer itself. So actually that is what we ended up doing with the pie face guy who would put um, the whipped cream pie in the face of his dad or his principal or whoever. We started going, okay, now you gotta get, we gotta get a couple peas before you do that because people are getting sick of uh, getting pie in the face and um, he was still loving it. But it wasn't as hard for him anymore to pee or poop in the toilet, he was really getting it. So it was easy to explain to that trainee, look, you know, you're gonna have to get two stickers on our chart and then you get to pie face. And then the next day it was three. And then the next day it was four. So we got a sticker after each peer poop instead of getting to do the pie face thing. Does that make sense? So um, we delayed his access to it. And that for him really worked. But you kind of have to have a trainee who's going to get that, that rule and have that sort of um, be able to go through the teaching of that with you effectively. With some trainees, you need to keep giving something every time. So another thing we'll do is decrease the magnitude of it. Um, so how powerful the reinforcer is. So say they've been earning, you know, uh, 10 um, gummy candies after every pee. Well, we might at this stage start going to nine and then start going to eight and then start going to seven. So we're just giving them a bit less of the volume of it, the excitement of it. Um, if what they've been accessing is, you know, the guy with the, um, crane machine who was uh, using that cool arcade uh, crane machine to get prizes every time he peed. Well, maybe at first he got three coins, so he got three chances, but now he only gets one. And then he starts having to earn a sticker and he gets a couple stickers and then he gets his one attempt. Like just a slow fade is really key. Um, and another, another piece too can be we another sort of keeps saying we're going to talk about it tomorrow, but this is a dense topic, right? And um, a lot of the sort of, you know, what ifs will come up in the scenarios that we'll go through then. Uh, but one thing is, and, and something that's also come up in the chat is if you kind of have some success at home but not at school or vice versa, how do you how do you do that? And in some cases, you need to do the training again in the second environment. But in some cases, you just need to replicate a few pieces of it in the other environment. So I often work with trainees where we've done the training at home and to get them to, to do this at school, we can sort of um, send a couple key components of our plan to school with the trainee. Like, okay, we've been using this reinforcer that worked awesome. We'll send it to school as well. Here's the schedule you can take them on. So we kind of, um, it's very case by case how we communicate across environments, but always err on the side of uh, more communication, right? Like giving more of um, what happened at home to school, giving more of what happened at school to home. The two environments have to work together for this to, to play out well. Um, another thing is we've been talking about home. I should say too, I, I mean, most of the work that we do is in homes um, at, at our organization and 
but we absolutely can work with schools. It's challenging to pull off rapid toilet training in schools. So often what we'll do in that, um, in that environment is more the long way that Pat will talk about tomorrow. But if you have been working in a home, you must try different bathrooms. This is another returning to normal life thing. You, you haven't done great toilet training if the trainee will only pee in their bathroom at home, right? Life does not occur at home, except during COVID. I mean, we've pretty much been stuck at homes. Um, but now that, uh, now that things are, yeah, I mean, potentially opening up again. A lot of trainees where we are in BC are back at school, so we're working with schools more again, is um, you always want to start with more familiar places and then move slowly over time to the most challenging settings. 99% of trainees that I work with, the mall bathroom is the most challenging setting. I bet everyone knows why. It's those hair dryers or those hand dryers that are so loud, right? Those blasting loud um, hand dryers. A lot of trainees that we work with would rather not go into the bathroom at somewhere like a mall. Um, luckily, a lot of malls are starting to have like separate or sensory friendly bathrooms where you can access um, them without, you know, it sounding like a dragon's gonna attack you with those things, um, those hand dryers. But yeah, I would, I would always consider those big echoey public bathrooms hand dryers, many stalls, that looks very different from a home bathroom, right? But what doesn't look different from a home bathroom that much is grandma's house bathroom or auntie's house or friend's house. So I would always start with a generalization to more familiar, close to your own house bathrooms, like that look similar. Um, and usually what we recommend is just, okay, you've had some success at home, trainees finish their rapid toilet training plan, they're really getting it, they're starting to pee or poop really quickly when they're brought to the toilet or they're initiating toilet use on their own. Next step, go to someone familiar's house for the day. Bring your reinforcers, do everything else kind of the same that you were doing at home and show them reinforcers occur here too. Like that's usually all it takes. Um, for some trainees we find we need to do more, but most, most, most of the time it's it's a, yeah, just the, the trainer going with the trainee to a new setting with the reinforcers can be key. Um, sometimes your squishy seat from home the first couple of times can help too, just making it, it really clear that it's the same expectation across the board. And then just move down your list until you get to the most offensive bathroom, the mall. So, you know, friends' houses, um, a more like a quieter community center bathroom, maybe the bathroom at the library. Again, these are all, you know, pre-COVID, we accessed all these things easily, so now it's a little more challenging. But um, yeah, getting, and then at the school, often the school might have um, a separate bathroom you can use, at least here in BC, I find that often. The school will have like a, a bathroom that maybe is for staff or it's a special, it's like a wheelchair accessible bathroom that we can use for a little while, just so the trainee can be in a room where it's just them and the trainer. They can have their seat from home easily. There's not a bunch of stalls and there's urinals and there, it just looks and feels totally different. And then over time, we could get them to use the um, bathroom at school with all the stalls and that sort of thing. So we're, so we're gradually making it more challenging. That's sort of the logic there. Okay. I have to say something about rapid toilet training that I think is helpful to know if you're going to do this. It feels like it's not working until it is, until it does. So here's a secret between me and my 750 friends or whatever. Every time you're doing this procedure with a trainee, there will always be moments where you're like, are you not getting this at all? Like I still have that. So it really, like in, in, as you're doing it, as you're going through it, there's gonna be a moment where they have an accident that you're, you're shocked by. So like the, you know, our Joey example even, he was nailing it. He was just bam, 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 peeing in the toilet. Every time mom took him, it was going awesome. Then he had a random accident in the, in the kitchen like five minutes after he'd had a success, right? It was, it was totally weird. Why, in, in Joey's mom's shoes, you might go, what is going on? I thought you were getting it. You have these moments where you're kind of like, what, what's up? But every time the person pees or poops, you, the trainer, the feedback that you give to them, which is either a reinforcer or a redirection back to the toilet for an accident, that helps them learn. So again, thinking about like parallel parking, right? If you've ever watched someone learning to parallel park, it looks like they don't know what they're doing every time. Like they're gonna hit the curb, they're gonna almost hit the car behind them, they're gonna almost hit the car in front of them, they're gonna park 
three feet away from the curb. They're going to park on the curb. But every time they do that, they're learning something, right? They're getting a little more sort of feedback on, OK, now I'm too close. Now I'm too far. The same sort of logic applies to learning anything hard. So when the trainee's learning toilet training, every time they pee or poop, the feedback that they get informs what's happening in the future and, and helping them to learn. So I just want to assure you that um, if there's moments where it feels like it's, you're not on track, but you think, you know, okay, but, but they're drinking enough. I got good reinforcers. I'm following the timing. Oh, they're having accidents. I assure you, accidents are part of the process. They're essential. The, the trainees always have accidents and it's okay, but when they happen, it feels defeating as a trainer. You're not really getting it, are you? So I promise you they're getting it. Um, keep going.